so I'm very happy to, to be the chairman of this, uh, this table, this session. Uh, I'm going to, to give the floor first to uh, Victor Belmer Thomas. Uh, when you see the titles of uh, the different papers, you, Victor is not here. Victor is not here? He, knows, he doesn't come? Okay. So the first one will be Frances. Everybody has around 15 minutes. We have to end at 11.30. 11 uh, I was going to say that it's not easy to find a link uh, between the papers, but as Victor is not here, maybe <laughs> it will be a bit easier. We will see it during the debate, and uh, to do not lose time, I all, uh, already give the, the floor to Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Thank you to Leonardo for um, many things including inviting me to this conference and giving me a chance to see so many old friends and to make new ones. And uh, it's always an honor for me to be on the panel with the gentleman to my right, who I read when I was a child and who've inspired me my entire intellectual life. Um, and that's, that's really quite sincere. Um, my paper is about political representation. And yesterday, Leonardo was reminding us about the dimensions of democracy um, that perhaps we can measure. Um, and a couple of those dimensions have to do with responsiveness and accountability. And I see representation as kind of embodying those. Um, and while, rep while responsiveness, um, as we might think about the relationship between votes and, and the formation of governments or the provision of policies that match public preferences um, could be empirically separated from the notion of accountability. I think, um, theoretically at least, there's a reason to connect to them, particularly since for many people in the world, um, they don't get to vote on the basis of the program of government that um, parties are providing, but rather they are being um, asked to vote, that they're being offered votes on the basis of the selective benefits that they may get if they vote for the patron. I'm speaking, of course, about patronage or clientelism as opposed to programmatic voting. So this is essentially the core of my paper. And um, where's the <coughs> Do I have the, the advanced? I need to advance the slides. I need that thing. Yeah. I need to, then I need to sit where Adam is. <laughs> Adam, do you want to advance the slides for me, Jimmy? Uh, I can. If uh, we have your presentation on. Where are you? See it, Hogopian. Yeah. Okay, you can now go to slide two. Yeah, you want this little gizmo? No, but, but it does not work. It's a port of sound. Okay, thanks. So the theme of the panel is the um, economic and political consequences for democracy. Um, and of course, the major economic development of the last 30 years in Latin America has been the, the turn, the sharp turn from state-led import substituting industrialization to what are very loosely called neoliberal economic reforms. And I say loosely because in some cases they are really quite neoliberal. And in other, I would, other countries I would characterize them as state and market reforms that are not necessarily neoliberal in the sense that the state is being so shrunk. But let me for the moment use the term neoliberal. So the literature is divided about what the effects of neoliberal reform should be on, can you hear me? Okay. Um, it's just easier if I, okay. tell me if you can't hear me. So the literature is divided about what the effects will be of economic liberalization. For friends of neoliberalism, 
economic liberalization should beget political liberalism. Good things should follow for political representation from economic liberalism. And it should be the case that firms and interest groups should shift attention from public regulatory agencies and officials to political markets, to political parties, legislatures, and public opinions. Politics should become more normal. Um, state resources can cut off, re state reform can cut off resources for clientelism and make access more difficult. So if you privatize, the notion here is if you privatize state enterprises, if you deregulate the economy, then you will reduce the scope for patronage. If you can reform budget institutions in the budgeting process, if you can reduce a role for legislators in every appropriation, you can reduce pork barrel spending. If you can provide social services on a universal basis, if you can provide welfare assistance and programs like conditional cash transfers, that should depress clientelism. And these reforms must be replicated at the subnational level. We had a panel yesterday about the disjuncture between national democracy and subnational authoritarianism or illiberal practices. And so these reforms would need to be repro re reproduced at the local level. Um, and so successful market reform should also shrink the pool of people who depend on clientelism. Trade liberalization and liberalization of the labor market should erode the dependence of voters on clientelism. That's one set of expectations. A quite contradictory set of expectations is that neoliberal reform will wreak disaster upon political representation. It will disorganize it, it will flatten it, it will demolish it. You will kill unions, you will grow the informal sector, and this will um, eliminate the voting constituency for labor parties. Um, we have our friend, many friends in the profession who have argued that clientelism is highly compatible with economic liberalism and that in this void of voter dealignment arise neo-populist leaders. I think it's clear after two decades, at least two decades after the launch of these reforms everywhere, that neither the liberal hope nor the critical nightmare has prevailed everywhere. I think that it's true that in some places, neo-populist political representation has been disorganized and neo-populist leaders have arisen. But I think it's also true in other countries that this has not happened. And that rather there's been a salutary move away from clientelism and toward more programmatic um, party competition. And I think that the puzzle here is that the pattern of the variation that we see in the effects of economic liberalism are not predetermined by each country's history. They cannot be predicted by that trajectory, but rather we have a genuine puzzle. How do we explain why some countries seem to make a transition from patronage to program, and other countries seem to have a degeneration from program into patronage? Um, Adam, can I have the next slide? I'm sorry to make you just, oh, oh, I have it now? Sorry, I can do it. Well. Okay. Um, so these are the questions that motivate the paper, and I think I've just sort of um, said what they are. Why has political representation be, been reorganized in different ways in different countries, um, and why has it been um, differently from each nation's past? And I'm going to just sort of preview here that I'm going to argue that Brazil becomes more programmatic and that Argentina becomes more patronage ridden. Okay, next slide. All right, so our prevailing paradigms don't really explain very well why this happens. Um, if we think about modernization and if we think about um, simple, uh, a simple relationship between socioeconomic modernization and development, um, we would expect to see um, development erode clientelism, but the process of, thank you, but the process of economic, um, the problem here is that the process of socioeconomic development uh, unfolds only very slowly, but in Brazil, it seems the programmatic competition has emerged relatively quickly. If we are thinking that it's a matter of people moving into urban areas and becoming wealthier, then we would, first of all, not expect to see the pattern of variation that we see in Latin America. We would expect to see, um, countries that are wealthier and more urban, um, having more programmatic politics, but we would also not expect to see sudden changes. And institutional determinisms, I think, can be just as um, risky 
to apply. Um, there is a second major view in our discipline in political science that believes that political representation is an epiphenomenon of the design of political institutions. <laughs> and according to this view, institutions should generate the incentives that determine the choices that parties and programs make, par uh, parties and politicians make for program and patronage. And I think that there's obviously effects of electoral rules and federalism on the way in which politicians behave, but not all parties in the same countries pursue the same linkage strategies, and some parties changed even in the absence of institutional change. So if institutions were determinant, we wouldn't expect to see um, the changes that we have. I think similarly, the notion of critical historical moments, while also interesting, can fall short because one would not expect to see, um, uh, I'm thinking here of Marty Schefter's classic work, um, if we explain what we have by the timing of the emergence of a mass electorate and the professionalization of the bureaucracy, again, we wouldn't expect to see change. Um, and um, major work by Herb Kitchelt and his co-authors a couple of years ago um, suggests that the patterns of party competition were laid in the attachment of social constituencies to parties in the post-war period. And where um, you don't have that attachment, new, uh, par new such parties can't really emerge. They can't overcome the costs of getting launched. <laughs> so I think we have um, a puzzle to explain. And there I go, okay, so, for, so in order to proceed, I just have to quickly, this isn't in the paper itself, but I need to just very quickly explain a key assumption of the paper. And that is that there's a trade-off between, the between the party choice for patronage and program. My argument here is, and I, can't, I don't, if I explained this fully, that would be the rest of my presentation. So I just want to very quickly point out that in cells two and four, up there, how much time? How much? So um, I'm arguing that there's a trade-off. At high levels of patronage provision, um, this tends to go hand in hand with low levels of programmatic competition. And similarly, um, ample programmatic competition tends to go together with low levels of patronage provision. And um, the reasons for that are that parties have to distinguish themselves in some way. So if they can distinguish themselves on program, they don't need to give patronage provision. But if they can't distinguish themselves on program, that's when they have incentives to provide selective benefits, constituency service, and so on. Um, and we can see, we can think about this intuitively that uh, Chilean parties, for example, polarized in the late 1960s when Congress was deprived of its particularistic functions. And in Britain, in the mid-19th century, parties became programmatic when the access of backbenchers to patronage was limited. That's when they became party-oriented. Um, we can have a debate later about why they can't do both. I just don't have time to do it now. Um, and I've got a couple of exceptions. Um, but again, I don't have time to do them. So the important thing then is to look at the stages of reform. So here's the, the core of the argument goes like this. You'll see it in the next two slides, this one and the next. The core of the argument is that reform proceeds in stages. And the first stage is a stage that I call sort of exogenous, at least a party competition. It can be exogenous to the country. It can be, ref it can be imposed by international financial institutions or bankruptcy. This is the kind of reform we think about as being stabilization and structural adjustment. This is simply controlling prices, perhaps liberalizing trade. And these reforms can have effects, but um, they are not the complete um, package of state and market reform. The more, the deeper reforms, like the reforms of the civil service, the prof professionalization of the bureaucracy, the um, and distributive reforms, these are endogenous to party competition. These happen because political parties, some political parties make the choice to pursue those policies. And so there is a, um, and the, so the argument then next is that um, whether or not this happens depends upon the incumbent party at the time of the reforms. And the argument goes like this, where first stage reform does not work in the sense that 
where it fails in the sense that patronage markets grow, budgets are unchanged, and, and the cost of buying votes falls. That would happen if you have a large informal sector. It would be cheaper to buy each vote. Um, and these can fail for a number of reasons. It can fail because budgets were balanced by cutting the uh, budget for repairing potholes rather than reforming budget institutions, for example. The cuts could be temporary. Trade liberalization could have unleashed such competition, depending on the way in which it was done, that you could really grow the informal sector. All the, the horrible consequences of neoliberal reform could be seen. And if this happens, it is just not likely there's going to be any second stage reform. But if the first stage of reform works, now there's a choice. Now it depends on who the incumbent is. If the incumbent, so my, my argument is that parties will pursue these strategies based upon their budgets for patronage, their access to patronage, the amount of patronage that they can, of state patronage that they can access, um, the size of the market that they have for patronage and program voters, and the costs of the provision of patronage to those votes and to those voters in order to win their votes. So if the party in power, but this is a relative calculation. This is a calculation that parties make relative to their opponents. So if the incumbent party has got a big patronage advantage, if, for example, you're the Peronists in Argentina and you've got networks all over the country and you are, your voters come cheaper than your opponent, main opponent, the radicals, then it is into your advantage to, to protect your patronage advantage and to not proceed with reforms that will curtail that advantage into the future. So you cut federal payrolls, but you transfer the employees to the provinces. And in Argentina, the reform spring leaks. In Brazil, on the other hand, the party in power in the mid, -nine, mid, -late, mid to late 1990s is the party of, of social, of, is Cardozo's party, is the, P, the PSDB, and relative to his competitors on the right, um, the, P, the PSDB cannot compete on patronage. And so some reforms begin, civil service, um, uh, budget institutions, um, and Bolsa Escola. The first conditional cash transfer program starts to get scaled up during the Cardozo administration. When the PT comes into office in, uh, 2000, in early 2003, the PT is really disadvantaged uh, on patronage. The PT scales up Bolsa Escola to Bolsa Familia and extends it to the entire country and continues with deeper state and market reforms. So, Yes. So, so now, yeah, so now I'm going to just, uh, so this is kind of a summary of what happens in each country and just focusing on Brazil first, here are the sort of cheat notes that Brazil um, has, uh, the, the size of the informal sector in Brazil, while it begins large, actually shrinks over the course of this decade. Um, and you see progressive health care reform, you see an expansion of access, coverage, and resources, you see redistributive pension reform, you see an expansion of benefits and coverage to the poor. And here is what, so here is, I'm, I'm claiming, we have an emergence of programmatic competition in Brazil. This particular slide is based on my survey of the Brazilian Congress in 1999, and here I have a series of measures of the median distance between legislators on a series of preferences about economic reform, um, which sort of emerges as the first dimension in a principal component analysis. I've also looked at um, the, the R square of the prediction of party for positions, and I've also looked at the degree of overlap. So this is just sort of a visual representation of the emergence of programmatic competition in a party system that didn't have any 10, 15 years earlier. And here is, this is just people, and so this is the sort of the, the translation from preferences to behavior. This is just a picture of W nominate scores of legislative voting in Cardozo's second term, the same term as my survey. And then just to sort of persuade you that this didn't all collapse with the moderation of the PT in the 2000s, I've just got, we can come back to this in the question and answer period if you've got questions, if you aren't convinced. This just shows that party still means something um, in the 2000s. And then if we look at, um, I thought Argentina was next. 
Okay, apparently Mexico's next. Um, here we, so I, I, I've been sort of contrasting Brazil and Argentina. I really need to do Argentina next. Okay, so there's Argentina. So Argentina, okay, thank you. So um, in Argentina, we see that there's sort of an opposite effect of the initial stage of neoliberal reform. We have low minimum wages. We've got a large informal sector. The informal sector is growing. Uh, we've got a really high unemployment rate. Those of you from Argentina knows that know that unemployment goes to 20% in the 1990s uh, by the end of the first Menem administration. Um, we do not see the same kind of expansion of social programs in Argentina. Planta Trabajar and Jefes y Jefas de Hogares are distributed on a basis that every econometric analysis that I have seen shows that parentist districts get favored. This is not the same program as Bolsa Familia and Bolsa Escola in Brazil, and as we shall see in a moment, it's not the same as Progresa and Oportunidades in Mexico. It is a politicized program that, is, that benefits parentist districts. Um, and we can see in Argentina that there's a wide gap in 1997 in my survey, but the other three surveys come from Salamanca. It's Manolo, Manolo is here yesterday, Manolo is here, so we, all, so we all thank Manolo for making this public good available to us. So the other, so these are the, the, as comparable questions as I could um, come up with across the surveys, and we can see a complete collapse of programmatic competition in Argentina. And this sort of is confirmed by our intuition about what happens to programmatic competition in Argentina after um, neoliberal reform. And let me go back to Mexico now, because Mexico is the case I haven't spoken about. So Mexico is interesting. So I've drawn the sharp contrast between Brazil and Argentina. Mexico, you would think, would, be, would follow the Argentine pattern. You would think the PRI is in power, and you would think that the PRI is a party that looks a lot like the Peronists. The PRI has got an incumbency advantage, it's got a patronage advantage, it's got networks all over the country. Um, but the PRI is already starting, the PRI's electoral hegemony is already starting to erode in the 1990s. And by 1997, which I think is the real cutoff point in Mexico, the PRI loses its congressional majority, it is losing power to um, the, the, the PAN is um, a, a formidable negotiating uh, negotiator about decentralization. And uh, those of you from Mexico know this story better than I do. Um, there is, it seems to me, a, a fracturing of, of pre-hegemony in a way that enable, and, and, a, and a decentralization of resources to different districts that, innate, that, that is, throws confusion into this picture. In this picture, Zedillo begins Progresa in rural areas. But when, he lose, when the PRI loses the presidency in 2000 and the PAN comes into power, the PAN is that agent that provides the um, impetus to deeper reform. The PAN scales up Progresa to Oportunidades and extends us to urban areas, extends health care through Seguro Popular. So we start to see a series, and, and there's also a civil service reform, at least at the national level. So we start to see the deepening of state reform in Mexico in 2000 after the PAN comes to power. So the last slide is just my summary of where we can position these parties, sorry. Um, on the original trade-off between patronage and program that I showed you. So it's a kind of a long paper and a, and a much longer book. Um, so this is sort of what I could do in 15 minutes, thank or you. 20, I don't know how long I took. <laughs> With the inflation. Uh, so thank you very much, Francis. Uh, we won't have a coffee break, so we, we, we can manage to, to have 20 minutes uh, interventions, if I may. And uh, so I, I, give, uh, I give the floor to Philip. Already? I thought it was the last one. Oh, no, it's Adam. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, it's Adam. It's a... uh, I need to get it. Uh, this is somebody. Don't have it. <laughs> 
going to be full screen? So, I need to begin with apologies to Leonardo because um, this is a paper that has no theory, no conceptual framework. It says nothing about democracy and it says nothing about economic development, which is not what he expected of me. Uh, moreover, apologies to some others of you. It's a purely rational choice paper. Uh, what puzzles me is a very narrow question, which is, so how does it happen that some countries succeed in acquiring the habit of changing government through elections, while others never do? So it's a pure piece of history, nothing else. Here's the motivation. This is a distribution of the number of times in the histories of particular countries, histories big, going back to 1788 or independence, whichever came late, later, as of 2008. So here are countries that never had experienced a change of government resulting from elections. And as you see, there are 68 of them, including the two elephants, China and Russia. And Switzerland. Pardon? Well, there are others. There are 68, Philippe. No, no, no. I know that Switzerland exists. I've heard from you 30, 30 years ago. I knew that there is always a Pago Pago that's called Switzerland. <laughs> This used, to be called, this used to be called the Pago Pago principle in political science meetings, namely, whatever one said, somebody would always come and say, but there is Pago Pago. Yes, Philip, there is Pago Pago. Because Switzerland, in your case, okay? Pago Pago. Pardon? No, it's not here. Uh, but, look, that... Once a country had won, uh, my batteries, uh, no. Once a country had won alternation, then there are many countries that had lots of them, including, as you see, a country that had 23 alternations in its past history, called the United States. So, I'm basically asking one question in two parts. Why is it that first alternation so difficult? And uh, why is it that the subsequent ones are easier? I have to ex give you some definitions and explain what the data look like. I should also look at my watch. I'm going to talk in terms of electoral spells. That is, think of a history of a country. I'll show it to you in a second. Yes. And think of periods when elections take place regularly. An electoral spell for me is a situation in which there is an election, somebody is elected, completes the first term, and then there is a second election. And what happens after the second election, I don't care. If this minimal condition is satisfied, that's an electoral spell. Spells can break down because of coups, auto coups, autogolpes, civil wars, other constitutional major violations. No, no, no. It's, they break down if there is an irregular transfer in office of the chief executive. Uh, alternation is very narrowly defined. I could spend time defining it, uh, all kinds of details. But what I basically have in mind is that the person at the party of the chief executive changes as a result of an election. The conditions that there must be some incumbent which presents itself can be person, a party, or designated successor, loses an election, and peacefully leaves office. That's an alternation. As you see, this is more or less what the data look like. There's some period, there's some elections, at least two. Uh, this is spell number one, and uh, there's no alternation in this spell. Then, many, many, many years later, there is another spell that begins in 1983, 
there's an election, and in this spell there are five alternations. So each country can have several periods in which elections take place continuously. These are called spells. Okay? So the questions are, why first alternation? If one occurs, is the second one more likely? If n minus one occurs, is the nth more likely? And uh, it, is it true that if you had more alternations, you're less likely to experience a constitutional breakdown? Here's my story. And it begins with a conversation of the streets of Warsaw in 1986 with a prominent communist reformer whom uh, at least Philippe knows and Torquato knows, but I don't know anybody else, in which uh, he said to me, well, we, the communist regime, are thinking of having a competitive election. To which I said, you're crazy. If you have an election, you're going to lose. This was his answer, quote, unquote. It doesn't matter whether we lose, but what we will lose. And I think that that what is quintessential. So what are you going to lose? Are you just going to lose an election? Which means that you continue as a political actor, you have a job, nothing happens to you, you compete in the next election, and maybe you will win, as the post-communists did in Poland in 1991. Yes. Or are you going to lose your life? your freedom, your fortune, maybe even your employment? Yes. That, I think, is the crucial question. Here is a piece of data, not from me, by Oskariba and uh, Wright, yes, of 199 rulers of autocratic regimes who released the reign of power, about half meant with violent death, imprisonment and exile. This is during the past 60 years. We all know you can build constitutional provisions, as the Chilean military did. You can declare yourself amnesty, as the Chilean military did. You can get all the guarantees from the opposition. That's not credible. Yes, you can still end up in jail. So here is basically, sort of, I, I want you to share the intuition. Yes. So European in 1899, Polish communists 89, South Africans. Putin today, yes? If Putin allows himself to be defeated in elections, what's going to happen to him? You know, he's not only accused of having amassed $40 billion. He's accused of actually bombing uh, a building in, Warsaw, in Moscow in which many people died in order to intensify uh, the Chechen war, yes? The opposition doesn't just want to defeat him in elections. It wants to destroy him. That's the way he sees it. So for him, the risk is unbearable. It's an extraordinarily risky operation to let the reins of power go for the first time. And why? Because you don't know what's going to happen to you. But once it happens, then what? Then the new winner knows already that the previous incumbent was of the kind who did allow himself to lose and left office if he lost. So this uncertainty is resolved. Now the risk is much lower. It may still happen. It may still happen that even yes, <coughs> that the new incumbent behaves like the previous one and does not let the reins of power go. But much of the uncertainty is resolved. Now for the lack of for the time, I'm not going to repeat this argument in detail, but show you some data. Uh, so this is what may happen after you analyze the situation. That the first incumbent does not risk losing. That the first incumbent does hold decent elections. And the second incumbent reciprocates. Or it may also happen that the first one does and the second does not reciprocate. Here are some historical background, just for you to peruse. These are the 19th century alternations. This is the f this column um, is the this is the first alternation. As you see, the first one in the world occurred in 1801. These are years of elections, not of inaugurations. In 1801, in the United States, uh, by the way, the country was on the brink of civil war. 
Yes, Jefferson prevailed probably only because Madison threatened to mobilize the Virginia militia. Um, this is the second and the third. When you see stars, that means that between the first and the second, there was a constitutional breakdown, at least one. So these, uh, these are continuous spells, like in the United States, so in Belgium, or in England, but in Colombia there was one in 1837, then there was a civil war, or civil wars, then there was one, one in 1848, civil wars, and then 1930. What is striking when you look at elections is uh, how often incumbents win them. I have information about 3,000 elections in the world that took place over the past two centuries, more or less, and take a guess how many of them incumbents won? Four out of five. 78%. Okay. Incumbents have advantages. Incumbents have all kinds of ways of prevailing. What you see here is, and it's not Switzerland, but uh, Luxembourg, uh, is the number of years in which elections were contested, but incumbents always won. Yes. I want to digress, if I may just. Uh, namely, note, this is part of the problems with defining democracy in terms of alternation. Yes, Luxembourg, Norway during this period, but even Botswana, whereas Japan, Italy, yes, we think of them as democracies. But, these are very long periods, at least 40 years I took as the criterion, in which elections were contested and incumbents continued to win. Luxembourg is the world record holder. Where is the old <laughs> uh, Here is a regression analysis for the first alternation. And I have to tell you, I was sort of thought, well, what may matter and what I have observed systematically um, one would think that path dependence would be crucial. Path dependence in the following sense. If you had repressed opposition in the past, yes, if you've killed, if you've tortured, if you stole, your risk is very high. Yes. You would also think that the institutional framework may matter. If you have all kinds of checks and balances, bicameralism, parliament, uh, monarchy, outside vetoes and whatnot, Maybe you'd feel a bit protected. As you see, what does matter is whether past elections were contested. Obviously, you can lose power only if the current election is contested. But what matters is whether past elections were contested. If they were not contested, that means you've repressed all the opposition, you're not likely to take that risk. And strangely, the age of constitution does matter, but the particular provisions don't. Nobody, it seems, believes that they would operate, yes? And income, per capita income, does matter. This is, does not predict very well, I can tell you. Yes, these factors, the uncertainty is so idiosyncratic, I think, that it's very hard to capture it in terms of these observable macro factors. There's past dependence, I'm not going to do it. Um, what happens once, once alternation? One alternation occurs. Well, there are 26 cases uh, uh, in which the next incumbent, either the next incumbent makes an autogolpe, yes, the winner of that first election in which alternation occurs makes an autogolpe, or the loser then makes a golpe and breakdown occurs. So it does occur, although it's not very frequent. Now here are the more interesting data. So what you see here is the probability of alternation. Now what is an alternation? Alternation is a conjuncture of two events. The incumbent lost and obeyed, that is, yielded office peacefully upon losing. Yes? So this is the number of past observations. This is the probability that an incumbent would lose an election given the number of past alternations. So as you see, if you enter into an electoral spell for the first time, there were no past alternations thus far, the probability of incumbent losing is about one in seven. If the incumbent loses, this is the probability that 
the income we lost and obey, yes, obeyed given that it lost. As you see, still 17% of incumbents try to hold on to power. So this is the probability of alternation as a function of past alternations. That's the probability of alternation in the next election. And as you see, it increases and it goes to about almost a half. What you have here is the probability that um, the spell will not break, that we will not have a constitutional breakdown given the number of past alternations. Altogether, we had 423 such spells. Censored means they still continue as of 2008, so we don't know if they broke or not. This is the number that broke. So as you see, if you start elections, do not experience an alternation. Um, more than a half, almost exactly a half of these spells end up in some kind of coup, civil war, out of coup, or something like this. Half of them break. And this is the probability that it will continue given <coughs> the probability that they will continue given that they are not censored. Okay? So as you see, this probability increases increases, increases, but reaches one only after six alternations. One can reduce that number somewhat because six is for Italy in 1922, and Italy had this transformismo system, yes, in which parties basically alternated by agreement. Uh, the record holder is Chile in 1973. That spell in Chile starts in 1932, lasted until 1973, had experienced those five alternations, and yet the system broke down. But as you see, basically sort of once you reach four, yes, these events are extremely rare. So this says, if you had some number of past alternations in the past, then that mechanism of solving political conflicts by having governments elected through, uh, chosen through elections, becomes entrenched. So, if you wish, elections are self-institutionalizing. And if you run regressions, uh, you will find that pretty much nothing matters, which means that they get, that they, uh, elections are self-institutionalizing across political and economic conditions. Finally, I need this. This is a regression for the probability of breakdown. As you see, if you had more breakdowns in the past, the electoral spells say how many periods there were in the past that broke, yes? The more political irregularities in the past, the more likely that the current spell will break. The more alternations in the past, the less likely that the spell would break, and income, again, matters. It's less likely to break in wealthy countries. Okay. Now I'm supposed to say something about Latin America. Now my problem with, with Latin America is that I, I don't believe there is one. I think there was one in the 19th century. I think there was one for a long time during the post-World War II period. I don't think there is one today. I'm in print. I have two articles more or less on this topic. Why? I don't think democracy in Chile is any inferior to the one in uh, Sweden. I don't think democracy in Argentina or Brazil is inferior to that in France or Italy. Uh, on the other hand, I think that Nicaragua has more to do, has closer to Belarus than to Argentina, or Honduras to Moldova than to Brazil. So I see so much heterogeneity within Latin America that I am not sure that taking the region as, so taking, making the assumption of a region as being in some sense dis homogeneous and therefore distinct from others makes much sense. Uh, data. So this is the distributions of the probability that the current electoral spell would break probably is multiplied by 100. In Latin America and in the rest of the world. 
as you see, Latin America is extremely heterogeneous. Yes? Some Latin American countries are very much like the rest of the world, and then there are some in which the current electoral spell is much less likely to continue. Here's a little table, the last row is missing, I couldn't squeeze it. Let me explain to you. This is the probability that the current electoral spell would break. Years is expected duration, the inverse of the probability of breakdown. That is how many years we would expect the current electoral uh, spell to last. Yes, 1,000 years in Chile, but not. There is Honduras with 17. This is, the, the, no, there's Honduras there hiding at 70, okay? I, I couldn't squeeze it in the table. Um, this is the number of European, and by European, I don't mean just Western European, I mean European. Uh, not quite as defined by the uh, UEFA, but uh, you know, not Azerbaijan and whatnot, uh, but uh, European, as we normally understand this term. So this is the number of European countries which have a higher probability of breakdown than Chile. So Chile sort of fits in the middle of Europe, yes. So does Argentina, Costa Rica, and whatnot. But when we get to here, then you see that these countries have a higher probability of breakdown than any European country. And this is the probability of alternation And that's it. Thank you very much. So, we, <laughs> we, are, we are in time. Uh, well, there is two things in common in the two contributions, which is that uh, there, is a, there is not an homogeneous uh, vision of Latin America. Maybe the concept itself of Latin America is in stake. So, we are going to, to see if this idea can, uh, can be challenged. And um, I, I give the floor to Philip Schmitter. Okay, thank you very much. I have two apologies to make. One that <clears throat> my co-author and wife, Terry Carl, was invited and could not come. And in fact, the most interesting part of this paper was provided by her. So what I did was, uh, what you have sent to you was a sort of rump version of what I contributed or we did together initially and then the really interesting part is left out. She was going to present that but regretfully could not come. Uh, the other apology is simply that I'm exhausted so uh, it will be difficult to present this. Now this paper came initially from a conference at Brown University in honor of Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Okay, and so we tried to revive dependency theory in honor of Fernando Enrique. So we're looking then at not simply dependency, of course, dependency now defined as globalization rather than dependency. And note, however, that in that redefinition, there are at least two very, very important changes in the nature of thinking about dependency both of which, incidentally, correspond to things that Fernando Enrique said some time ago, but nobody picked up on. The first one, of course, is this, he called it associated dependent development. That is, he was one of the first people to observe not merely the existence, importance of a dependency relationship built into the center periphery nature of the international economy, but that that could be overcome. Up to that, they had this sort of the development of underdevelopment, the kind of notion that dependency was a permanent self-reproducing situation which subordinated the periphery ad eternum to inferiority or whatever. And clearly, globalization has produced some very, very substantial changes in the relative positions, etc. And the other has to do with the subject matter of this conference. Namely, one of the assumptions of dependency theory, of course, was that it was not only reproducing the inequalities between countries, but it reproduced the inequalities within countries, between a particular kind of privileged 
comprador was the usual uh, bourgeoisie and a subordinate uh, population. So the relationship then with inequality was regarded also as somehow self-reproducing, if not actually getting worse. And obviously we have seen then with globalization, particularly of course in the case of the famous BRICS and China A number one, that the globalization has in fact made some very major changes in internal inequalities, especially bringing a number of even millions of people out of abject poverty by bringing them into the capitalist market in diverse ways. So a revival, yes. I am only responsible in this paper for a rather modest statistical component. The basic question was to look at what evidence we have about changes in inequality roughly from about 1970 to, I think at the time we first did this, to 2004. That's important to keep in mind, the, the date of 2004. And I think all of you who work with this field of aggregate data know that there's some pretty serious problems about data reliability in terms especially of income data, but it's there. And uh, I make use of uh, very simple non-parametric statistics. Uh, I don't have the same passion for regression analysis that Adam has. In fact, <laughs> I try to stay away from it as much as I can. So these are simply to take a number of countries, and here I entirely agree with Adam. It seems to me that if we want to learn something about Latin America, we must compare Latin America with the rest of the world. It seems to me to be very limited and limiting simply to make comparisons within Latin America. There's absolutely no reason to believe that comparisons within Latin America, that's the appropriate universe any longer, if it ever was, and therefore we have to try to place this, or in this case, the relationship between inequality and, as we'll see in a minute, the three great transformations that have taken place since the mid-1970s, uh, in which case then Latin America is simply a subset of countries within this wider universe. In this particular case, uh, the universe uh, which I could operate with was about 107 countries. Uh, I got rid of all sorts of little tiny countries of islands here and there, for one thing. Uh, I also got rid of, I forgot that there's a, there's a wonderful euphemism of the World Bank, which is something like countries under stress or something like that. That is to say, and if you're in the middle of a civil war, it doesn't seem to me to make much sense to take income distribution statistics. I mean, Somalia or whatever it is. That got rid of, I think, 14 or 15. So anyway, you end up, I ended up with 107. There are also obviously data availability, problems of data availability. And then Latin America is somehow uh, in, in that universe. And the basic question was, which of these three great transformations has had the greatest impact? And of course, in what direction on uh, the evolution of inequalities? Um, since 1970. A, a footnote about 1970, because for those of us who work on European politics, um, Western in this case, um, we now, I think, know pretty clearly in retrospect that the mid-1970s was a watershed moment in the evolution and relationships between capitalism and democracy in Western Europe. Partly, of course, it's symbolized by the oil the two successive oil crises, but something very clearly changed. We usually talk about uh, the change, if not disruption, in what we would call the post-World War II social contract, so to speak, that prevailed roughly from 1945, if you wish, or 50, really, until 1973, 74, or a bit later and which was characterized, of course, by greater equality, greater social protection of various kinds. And for me, of course, corporatism being a component of that negotiated kind of relationship between capitalism and democracy that characterized most, not all, but most Western European countries in that period. Something changed, and so we see that watershed, and there's no reason to believe that that's only for Western Europe. Okay, now, 
So we have 107 countries. We have these three transformations. The first one is globalization, of course. The second one that took place later than the mid-70s, of course, is the collapse of communism, and especially the collapse of a bipolarized world, which in this interpretation gave to a certain number of so-called non-aligned countries a particular kind of bargaining power uh, between the two powers, and therefore presumably a capacity to <laughs> extract resources and increase their relative role in a variety of international forums out of this ambiguous or ability to play off, so to speak, the West uh, and the East. That ability collapsed <laughs> with the collapse of the Soviet uh, system, and that's certainly one of the great transformations. And and not only, of course, for these underlying countries, but also for many other countries, particularly, of course, in Western Europe. And the final one is democratization, of course, symbolized by the famous Revolução do 25 de Abril in Portugal in 1974, and then the subsequent. So we have these three, democratization, depolarization, or whatever it is, and globalization as kind of the global context. What I try to do in the paper is to classify these 107 countries into those, in each of those dimensions, very simply, to those which underwent strong globalization, those which had already been globalized and more or less sustained their position, usually indicated simply by exports and imports as a percentage of gross national product, although that's probably not the best indicator or the only, the unique, unique indicator, but was the one I had at hand. And then, of course, democratization, those who were already democratized, those who, and those who didn't even make an effort to, so to speak, change regime uh, during uh, that particular period. I can be very brief in terms of the results because, oh, another thing that's in this is something which uh, Fran made use of, which I think is a very, uh, um, I won't say healthy, but useful, device, and that is rival hypotheses. Trying to understand that globalization could, you could make cases for globalization increasing equality or decreasing equality in terms of economic and social distribution, and then you look at it, and not surprisingly, you discover that globalization has had a massive impact on inequalities. Uh, in, in, uh, so the more uh, those countries that fall into this category of undergoing substantial globalization in that period also turn out to be those countries which have had the largest increases in, uh, let's say, uh, Gini <coughs> index to use the normal uh, empirical indicator for income and distribution. So it's globalization, all three have an impact. So in every one of those categories, the countries that undergo either globalization, either the collapse of the bipolar relationship, particularly, of course, the collapse of the eastern end of the pole, and those that undergo democratization, all of them have more significant changes as inequality. The striking finding, of course, is the relationship between democratization and increased inequality. This is counterintuitive. It's not at all counterintuitive to imagine that liberalization, in fact, liberalization almost uh, guarantees, or even those who argue in favor of it often argue precisely because it will concentrate wealth in the hands of those who will create jobs, invest, and blah, 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 in the usual, the ideological justification. And in the case of uh, um, depolarization or collapse of the Soviet Union and its uh, empire, uh, it's obvious that you move from a relatively equal, although there's a, there's a problem with that, of course, it's a measurement problem, is that probably access to valued goods in Soviet systems was even more unequal than in capitalist systems, it's just they weren't monetarized, so there were all sorts of things you couldn't get unless you were in the nomenclatura, so to speak. So while the official statistics make these countries look very equal, the unofficial qualities of life distributed in these countries was often very, very unequal. In fact, various kinds of goods were literally unobtainable unless you were in the nomenclatura. I won't go into that. That's a, a measurement 
issue, but still, those countries in which the Soviet system collapsed experienced, and Russia is a number one case, of course, the greatest increase in income inequalities in the entire sample, for that matter. So, finally, just again, I want to, I don't have a presentation, so I can't present the data, so I'm sorry about that, but I've been kind of running around and I didn't have a chance to, to make a fancy uh, presentation, but the data is in the paper, which I gather you have all uh, received. Um, so all three, there's an impact. The counterintuitive one is democratization and increased economic inequality. Right? That's the one that, that is striking. And here we have, I, I then take a look at it from a different perspective or using the same data or trying to. Namely, <clears throat> there are two opposite arguments in the literature about democratization and inequalities. The first is the classic one, namely that democratization puts through the electoral system uh, resources at the disposition of the poor, as opposed to pre-democratic or liberal democratic systems in which the franchise is limited to you know, men having property over a certain, whatever, the usual historical business. But once you have then uh, mass enfranchisement of men and women, um, presumably, this puts resources at the hands of the poor that didn't exist before, and therefore, the expectation would be that with democratization, it would be the lowest tenth or twentieth of the population who would benefit the most. So the expectation would focus then on the mobilization then of these excluded groups from the system, and therefore, you should see a transfer of wealth to the lowest, the, the, the poor, the lowest 20 percent, let's I think that's how I operationalize it. The rational choice literature says no, 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 no. It, it, it will go to the median voter. That is to say, since parties will be competing for that guy in the middle, it will be the middle per that politicians will compete and distribute income then. As a, it turns out from the data that this, they're wrong. Both of these hypotheses did not happen. That is to say, both of the lower 20% and the middle 20% tended to decline. More so, I might add, incidentally, in the middle 20%. That is to say, the, the so-called median voter hypothesis just is nonsense, to tell the truth. It makes logical sense, but in the real political world, it doesn't operate that way. So the extreme poor did slightly better with democratization than the middle groups did, but it was the rich, it was the top 10% <laughs> that actually did the best. Now this comes with another argument that, that I've made elsewhere, and that is one of the most striking characteristics of democratization in its initial phase is the fact that it was so much less consequential than we believed. Now, I was in a particularly weird position in thinking about this because I got involved in this with the Portuguese transition to democracy, which in retrospect was the most bizarre of all because the Portuguese one was, quote, revolutionary. It was accomplished by nationalizations, redistribution of, of land, a massive transformation, in uh, at least immediate, uh, of income toward the poor and even to the middle class, but certainly massive expansion of the role of the state uh, as a result of the 25th of April. Footnote, Portugal now has a more unequal distribution of income than any other, I think it's more unequal in Spain, so it, it had this massive, I hate to use the word populist because I did this the other day and got into a lot of trouble, but massive redistribution at a moment in 74 and 75, but already by uh, 80, 81, 82, those had been reversed, and Portugal today is one of the most conservative, and, and of course it's in crisis for other reasons now, but it, those were reversed. So Gini coefficient for Portugal today is one of the worst uh, in Europe, despite the revolution. But anyway, the expectation was that democratization would have these extremely consequential if not immediate impact on the distribution of wealth, property even, not just income, but wealth, right? It didn't elsewhere. 
And so the fact that democratization has had less immediate consequences than most of us, certainly I, expected is an important component of all. Therefore, it's not surprising in some sense, although it took a while for me to learn this, that democratization was not accompanied then by some kind of immediate change in the distribution of economic inequality. Finally, there is a comparison hidden in here um, in which I do sort of what also Adam has just done. Namely, I started out with the assumption there's no reason to treat Latin America any differently than the rest of the world. So they're hidden away in among these 170 countries and they don't play any, you know, it's no presumption that the relationship is likely to be any different in Latin American countries than elsewhere. Then I do have insulted, inserted in the latter part of the paper a specific comparison between the evolution of economic inequalities in the, I think it's 22 or 23 post-communist post countries as opposed to the Latin American countries. And uh, you may be not surprised to learn that it's because income inequality increases even more in the post-communist countries, but in both cases, they're in the same direction and significant. Fine, to conclude, if Terry were here, she would produce the best half of the paper, which is, of course, what has happened since 2004. It just turns out that this exercise, partly because I was in a hurry and I just didn't have access and I had to do it for that deadline of that conference, ends there. What has been taking place in Latin America has been a reversal of that since 2004. Brazil being the most interesting case, Chile also, Uruguay, and even Mexico. So I, I haven't, don't know anything about Argentine data, but we have reason to be suspicious about Argentine data, do we not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't even, okay, okay. In, in any case, what her part of the paper would deal with then is the extent to which, in some sense, the, what our expectations were correct, democratization does lead to greater economic, but not right away. And in fact, what these countries essentially did was to buy time, but with successive, in this case, rotation in power, all of these cases, then you begin to get the introduction. So there is a policy response which can produce greater equality, economic equality. We don't go into wealth. This is a problem, incidentally, just as a footnote, right? I mean, these are income inequalities. We can't get the data on wealth. And of course, one of the features of globalization is it makes it increasingly difficult to find out where the wealth is. So finding out what the distribution of wealth as opposed to income is uh, become now almost uh, prohibitive. You just can't imagine or just can't do it. But anyway. That was going to be her part and sort of what is specific countries have been doing and the actual, you know, rather significant reversal of the <coughs> earlier trend. So that the first 20 or so years of democratization are associated with increased economic inequalities, income inequalities anyway, and then at least in certain cases and specifically and especially in Latin America. So this is one area where Latin America becomes, I think, uh, if I won't say unique, different and not everywhere, of course. So there's always lots of variation within Latin America. And that's what, um, th that's the good part of the story. So if you believe in equality, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So again, we have a question about specificity of Latin America. Uh, it is a common, uh, common thing in those um, interventions. But I give the floor to the first um, discussant, Bert Hoffman. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel. Uh, thank you uh, first to Leonardo for organizing this wonderful conference. And thanks to the panelists, because we really had the papers in in time by all Four of them, that includes Victor Boma Thomas, who uh, also wrote a paper and he couldn't present it, but I really would like to highlight the discipline of the panelists. Um, okay, uh, coming back, Philippe uh, spoke yesterday about the qualities of democracy, that we should think of uh, quality in plural. Um, 
and probably we should also think of qualities of democracies if we already get into the plural because we have this variety of different types of uh, democracy and Elena kind of in her question made the case that it is a good thing not to have a one-size-fits-all model to measure up all democracies. Of course, we, we should have minimum thresholds, but um, in a way monoculture, of course, is not only bad in agriculture, but perhaps also in the, uh, in the social uh, sphere. Um, so actually, variety is probably a strength, and I would like to apply that also to this panel. We have a variety of approaches um, in this panel, um, tackling the issues from very different scholarly approaches and backgrounds. We had Philip's revival of dependent theory. Uh, Burma Thomas made a rather historic uh, approach. Then we have this uh, going into the deep, large N of 3,000 elections on the rational choice model you presented. And we, we had the uh, paper by Fren, uh, which kind of takes, discusses patronage in terms of budget market markets, costs, uh, in a way. So I think variety is a great strength of this panel, as it is of Red Gob in general. So perhaps you wanted to know what is linking the, the papers together. One of the issues certainly is uh, 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 unity and diversity, we could say. Um, we have different approaches, but we all kind of try to get to, get to the issue of what uh, economy, uh, economic implications has democracy or democracy has for economic implications. Um, Okay, so perhaps start out with Philip's paper and the, uh, or Philip's and uh, Terry's paper with the inequality thing. One of the points I wanted to uh, raise, you already raised yourself, that is the <coughs> concentration on income is not really sufficient. You mentioned wealth, and I think that's very important. Fixed capital is a key aspect. And what struck me in your presentation and that on the paper, you highlight how sticky inequalities are, that they are really for the long haul. You took the Portuguese case now here, but it's, it's broader in the paper. And I think that probably brings us to having to think of inequalities in a broader array of uh, sets. And um, of course, we have the Gini index, which is very important, but we should link this also to what we heard from Mitch in uh, your paper, ethnic and gender and all the usual suspects of different inequalities we have to, to be aware of. Um, and this also could uh, include, we have heard about family politics. I think family ties are just a very underestimated aspect in that they go along general, uh, 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 along ethnic lines, but not usual. And I think those, the interweaving of all these different inequalities makes inequalities so sticky. So you can have inequalities uh, in the Gini coefficient. Um, Brazil portraying a good picture now of uh, improving the trend. But the question is how uh, durable that will be, how structural that will be. And the paper by Boma Thomas highlighted the social policies as a really big achievement of uh, Latin American policies in recent times. But the question is how sustainable is that change? And we could think the question of the rising middle class, is that really a rising middle class, or is it poor with more money? Uh, meaning that, of course, we have more wealth to distribute, but does it do a structural change? And if we would have, in Brazil, a downturn in the money to spend, would we fall back onto the same old story, or do we have a substantial change in the social structure? So I think that is a very important um, point, and I wouldn't go into the details of that, but we can, uh, you mentioned Portugal, we can even think of Cuba. We had the most profound revolution in the continent and we still see inequalities re-emerging with a vengeance along ethnic lines, along uh, uh, family ties, and with much uncertainty about the future, even if we had such tremendous change, um, which is the question of how to make it um, durable, all the more important. Um, Perhaps that it is it, but I am tempted to say, and Switzerland. Um, so what about Switzerland? And just to make the point that even in Switzerland, the inequality issue is a vital issue. We just had the referendum on this 12 to 1 uh, limiting manager. 
uh, salaries, it didn't go through. But even in a country like Switzerland, inequality is a big issue in the democratic politics of um, the demands that what citizens expect from um, as outcomes of democracy in a way. Or as a legitimate claim of um, there should be some degree of responsiveness to the issue of inequalities. So briefly to, to Adam's paper, um, first I hate to, to contradict you, but um, you, did, you said you would not say anything about democracy. You did say a lot about democracy, because actually um, one of the things I take away from that paper is democracy is about expectations. It's a key issue what you expect. If you expect the other one to be reciprocating the favor of seating office or not, so I think the whole issue of expectations uh, is really important and linking it to the inequality on social policy issue, or also to, to your paper, it is a big question if you uh, set up a certain social policy or redistributive policy and you think that will stick even if I leave office. Or if you think, well, I have to do it now and grab the money and run because the next one will undo everything I do. So I think that idea of the expectations we can really take to to a much broader uh, perspective on democratic politics, and that helps perhaps um, um, also see the, the social policies and the clientelist um, discussion in that light. What made me a bit um, unhappy about your happy ending uh, is the, the question of what does it tell us for democratization. And we have the lesson that um, it depends on what you lose and not if you lose. And I think we have a tendency in recent years to um, scale up the terms of what uh, autocrats can lose with all the debate about the um, transitional justice and the International Criminal Court and the like. So again, if I take Cuba, what does Raul Castro have to lose or Fidel? They have to lose quite a lot. I mean, the more handshakes Obama give them, the less I may have to lose. But in, in a way, we have this judicialization of politics that Sanchez de Losada is being uh, uh, gets a trial, and everybody gets a trial for for corruption or for whatever um, abuse that there is on the table, and that really uh, makes the issue of what you have to lose much more thorny if you again, expect to not get away with it that easily, even in not so autocratic regimes. Take the Bolivian case. I mean, you have a very strong tendency to bring everybody to court. Not que se vayan todos al exilio, that was some years ago. Que se vayan todos now, and um, bring them to court and hold them responsible, which in many ways, I suppose we all agree to hold people accountable for, for what they do in office, but I see a big problem in that respect. Mm. And perhaps the last thing I would um, kind of um, bring to the table with regard to that presentation, it's such a huge um, quantitative uh, approach, not distinguishing between 19th century and the 21st century, but at all. Uh, of course, you, I know that you definitely would have flagged to this kind of uh, unhistoric or ahistoric approach in a way. Um, but I would f like to focus on the regional aspect. You said Honduras is more cl is closer to Moldova than maybe so, but what? Um, speaking about probabilities, isn't there a certain regional aspect to it that what happens in Honduras really raises or lowers the probability of what happens in the neighboring countries? If the coup gets away with it in Honduras, what does that mean for? Salvador, Nicaragua, whoever. Um, whereas what happens in Moldova doesn't really have any impact on probabilities of what will happen in Honduras or in Guatemala. So I think there's a regional uh, aspect to it which is very important in the terms of expectations, raising probabilities, which I hope your mathematical regression analysis can uh, uh, count into it at one point. Mm -hmm. So being brief, coming to, to uh, Fran's piece, uh, an impressive piece, I think. Um, 
the issue why political representation has been reorganized differently, again, brings us back to the question, can we have democracy without parties? Or in a way, your question is, um, what democracy do we get from what parties? Um, and uh, this, of course, has to do with um, patronage clientelism, however we want to call it. I was a bit surprised on the choice of cases. Obviously, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico seem evident in the sense that they are the big ones. Um, but there's a certain bias towards cases where the party system remained intact in some way. I mean, we have the pre and the pan, and uh, they remained intact in a certain degree in Brazil also. And um, in the Argentinian case, the Periodista Party probably also will be there in 1,008 years, whatever was their prediction yet for Chile. Um, but we, we have cases like Venezuela, where the party system broke down completely, or Ecuador. And um, what would you think would happen if you would take into account this type of um, party breakdown? I mean, Venezuela, you have high budgets here in the party system, which could have a very, well, okay, I leave that question to you, perhaps. Um, and the other thing I just briefly uh, would like to, to put on the agenda, not as a critique to the paper, not at all, the paper focus on the link between parties and citizens or voters, but there's also, if we take the neoliberal agenda in a broader perspective, what is the link between parties and the economic actors, the companies, the BNDs in, in Brazil, the, the, the banks, um, but also if we think about the Mexican case, the mafias, uh, the, the cartels, there's some clientelist patronage included in this, which is not so neoliberal. I mean, the, the what would, let's take the big Brazilian companies, Embraer, Odebrecht, Petrobras, be without the state, or their links to the state in a way, and the mafias, you could make the same kind of case. So if we want to understand what how the parties developed in the neoliberal age in that sense, um, probably that would be something for another agenda uh, to do research on what clientelistic patronage if, uh, links they maintain to not the voters, not the citizens, but to the uh, big economic actors. Would we see the same, essentially? Okay. Um, Perhaps just to finish off political representation, you focus on the parties, um, which is other forms of participation and uh, direct democracy, and that is a good subject for us to perhaps deal with the next uh, issue of the Red Gop meeting next year. But uh, I find it a very interesting piece. All of them, I think, were really great contributions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, so a uh, lot of things to discuss. But I uh, give the floor to Frederick to have more things to discuss. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Michel. Voy a hacer mis comentarios en español y eh, hacer como unos comentarios más generales sobre el tema de los efectos políticos y económicos o socioeconómicos de la, de la democracia en América Latina. Y para eso, partir de una definición minimalista de, de la democracia como forma de organizar la competición política y de distribuir los recursos en una comunidad. Y con esa definición, mmm, lo que se analiza son las, los vínculos, las relaciones entre la redistribución de los recursos económicos y de los recursos políticos. Y creo que el texto de Adam uh, se encuentra perfectamente en este debate, porque uh, justamente uh, toma en cuenta el tema de la distribución de los recursos políticos con las reacciones de los per perdedores, del loser consent. Y sobre... Esas relaciones en el texto y en la presentación de Philip Schmitter, uh, Philip Schmitter uh, retoma los tres mecanismos por los cuales la democratización puede provocar o acelerar una redistribución de, de recursos. Uh, el primero es abrir una oportunidad de acción colectiva para que los que no tenían recursos o que tenían menos recursos puedan presionar las políticas públicas y obtener beneficios. La segunda, que es la concepción más racionalista, que es la apertura de la competición entre los partidos que puede generar una distribución hasta el centro o hasta electores más medianos del, en el centro del sistema. 
Y la tercera que uh, propone Philip Schwinter, que es como la, la más uh, innovadora para uh, comprender lo que está pasando en América Latina, que es más una concepción uh, según la cual uh, la democracia puede aumentar el nivel de la, de la desigualdad, que eso es más contraintuitivo y por causa de, por ejemplo, de colusiones entre los intereses de los dirigentes políticos, los nuevos dirigentes, y uh, los intereses de las élites económicas. Uh, en el texto de Víctor Burmer, Thomas, uh, Víctor Burmer nos llama a tomar precauciones al evaluar las consecuencias de la democracia a nivel económico. Y dice que es un impacto muy difícil de comprobar y también que no debe ser exagerado. Y, Tomando en cuenta esas precauciones de este texto, que fue más un texto introductivo, uh, los diferentes textos de, de este panel tienen por lo menos dos características comunes, creo. La primera es que todos evalúan las relaciones entre democracia y distribución de recursos desde una perspectiva histórica, a más o menos largo plazo, pero uh, hay esa dimensión procesual de, uh, de pensar los efectos de la democracia. Y el segundo aspecto es que todos estos textos, textos pueden ser analizados desde una dualidad entre ganadores y perdedores. Siempre, siempre hay ganadores y perdedores en un sistema político, son sistemas generadores de perdedores a nivel político, pero a nivel económico también. Así que la cuestión es, claro, eh, ¿quiénes son los ganadores y los perdedores de la democratización en América Latina? Y ¿qué Pierden los que pierden, es la cuestión que uh, ha dicho como Adán uh, Pcheworski en, en su presentación. Y también creo en qué condiciones uno pierde o uno gana. Y cómo ese contexto uh, de las derrotas o de los fracasos, que son cosas diferentes también, una, der una derrota no siempre es un fracaso. Y uh, durante la transición hacia la democracia, como en Brasil, por, ej por ejemplo, uh, unos derrotados tenían interés en perder uh, elecciones uh, para mantener un nivel mínimo de participación política autorizada. Y creo que a nivel político, el nuevo marco jurídico eh, con eh, el nuevo constitucionalismo que tuvo dos olas y la ola de los años 2000 también, que eh, retoma esta cuestión del constitucionalismo, eh, ha generado nuevas reglas y un nuevo juego político que tiene menos riesgos para los perdedores. Así que, uno puede participar con, podemos decir, más tranquilidad a este juego político y a, al juego electoral. Eso genera unas evoluciones de los comportamientos políticos con esa transición, con un nivel más alto de pacificación de la vida política y uh, una influencia mayor de uh, los medios de comunicación, de una comunicación política uh, más uh, trabajada. Eso también, este nuevo marco jurídico, abre nuevos espacios de participación política convencional por la inclusión uh, de los excluidos por el voto políticamente, que eso genera también nuevas esperanzas, y uh, de participación política no convencional, como las movilizaciones sociales, y así podemos también analizar este proceso de uh, negociación de paz uh, en varios países. Y lo que me parece más interesante acá uh, subrayar a nivel político sobre los efectos de uh, la, la democracia es la posibilidad de generar una renovación del personal político. Con esas dos olas de renovación en los años 90, con uh, la emergencia de nuevos líderes neopopulistas como Fujimori, Menem, Color, uh, pero también lo que uh, uh, muestra uh, Frances en su texto, Uh, unas renovaciones a nivel administrativo de las élites administrativas y una racionalización también de a la selección de los dirigentes y altos funcionarios. Y hay esa segunda ola de renovación también después en los años 2000 con el giro a la izquierda y uh, la llegada en el poder de personas que uh, tomaron muchos riesgos durante los periodos autoritarios uh, para uh, participar políticamente, para uh, decir cosas políticamente y que ahora uh, llegan al poder uh, por las urnas. Eso genera una pregunta importante, que es cómo reaccionan las víctimas de la renovación, las élites tradicionales uh, que uh, tienen que salir, que dejar el poder, de uh, cuál es el nivel de consentimiento de esos derrotados, que políticamente la democracia produce mucho más perdedores que ganadores. Y, paradójicamente, esa democracia se mantiene y se construye a través de las derrotas. 
No hay estabilidad política democrática sin el reconocimiento de la derrota por los derrotados. Es como en una guerra. Una guerra no acaba sin el reconocimiento de una, de una guerra. A este nivel hay unos trabajos comparativos de la historia militar y de la historia electoral que pueden ser interesantes. Pero los derrotados son los pilares de la democracia y uh, el tema de la aceptación de la derrota uh, para mí es fundamental. A nivel de los candidatos, y lo que podríamos analizar sería, uh, por ejemplo, uh, la aceptación de, uh, del resultado de los candidatos en términos uh, de evaluación de las capacidades de los electores, esa distanciación entre uh, dirigentes y bases electorales, pero también a nivel más objetivo de empleos y carreras políticas. Y los, el riesgo, y es un vínculo también con otro tema que no hemos abordado en estos días, de la profesionalización política, pero lo que tienen uh, que perder son uh, empleos, pero también posibilidad de emplear y de consolidar uh, redes clientelísticas. Hay otro nivel de aceptación que puede ser interesante, que es la aceptación por los militantes, los militantes y las reorganizaciones de los partidos políticos después de las derrotas, en términos de programas políticos, uh, y esa transición uh, de los partidos uh, uh, clientelísticos de patronaje hacia uh, un, un, unos partidos programáticos, eso también creo tiene que ver con esa cuestión de la aceptación de las derrotas. Y podemos ver que algunos partidos latinoamericanos tienen más dificultades en este punto. Por ejemplo, el PSDB, que perdió las elecciones en 2002, con, con la alternancia, con, cuando llegó el Partido de, de los Trabajadores en el poder, uh, y que nunca tuvo, uh, supo uh, retomar, uh, se reorganizó profundamente para uh, reconquistar el poder. Pero hay varios otros uh, uh, ejemplos. Y también hay este el tema más general de la aceptación del resultado por los votantes, los electores cuyos candidatos han perde, perdido las uh, elecciones. Hay unos trabajos de Blaise y Nado sobre uh, la contestación de los uh, resultados, quién contesta y por qué contesta y para qué beneficios. Pero también hay esas cuestiones del abandono de la participación política o hasta el abandono de la comunidad política. Y eso también en democracia, no solo en régimen autoritario, los perdedores pueden... Uh, tener que salir, tener o querer salir. ¿sí? Si gana la izquierda, me voy del país y abandono mi comunidad política. Uh, esos son temas que podríamos como profundizar uh, a nivel uh, de los efectos. También hay este tema de los efectos psicológicos uh, en términos de uh, cómo los dirigentes van a... Uh, reaccionar o tomar en cuenta los efectos sobre las bases uh, electorales o militantes. Y eso podríamos verlo también a nivel de las uh, reacciones de las personas que perdieron ele elecciones, pero que estaban en el poder y que per perdieron como puestos uh, de poder, como uh, esas condiciones de poder. Por ejemplo, el caso de El Salvador en 2010 con la elección de Funes y... Uh, y la llegada del, uh, de la Frente uh, Farabundo Martí de Liberación al Poder, uh, y la reacción de la arena, la arena que uh, ocupa el poder durante 20 años, y este momento fue un momento muy fuerte, muy tenso, uh, del proceso de democratización. Otro aspecto que uh, no fue abordado en este tema, en, en, este, en, en esos días, y que me parece importante, es el tema de las reelecciones. Los que pierden, pero los que llegan al poder, que quieren mantenerse en el poder. Eso es la definición como inicial de, uh, de, de la participación electoral, que participar para ganar y para quedarse en el poder. Y ese tema de la reelección en términos de uh, efectos de democratización sobre uh, organización política me parece uh, importante. Para terminar, uh, algunas algo sobre el, los efectos a nivel socioeconómico, uh, porque los textos de Philip Schmidt, uh, Frances y uh, Víctor son uh, focalizados sobre esos, y han mostrado muy bien los tre tres momentos uh, de uh, transformación de las uh, relaciones socioeconómicas, como dos minutos, cinco, <risa> un, un minuto. <risa> la primera fue el, el, el periodo de la década perdida, 
con la difícil gestión de las herencias autoritarias, de la crisis de la deuda, que fue un periodo marcado por grandes desilusiones eh, en la población, esas frustraciones de, de esperanzas, con promesas no cumplidas y generada una crisis económica, social, pero también moral eh, en eh, la sociedad. Eso tiene que ver con el, ter el tercer mecanismo de la democracia que produce más desigualdad en una primera fase. Después hubo ese periodo de reorganización estructural que uh, Frances uh, ha muy bien uh, trabajado en su texto, bajo la presión externa, la, el contexto de uh, inserción uh, de los países en el contexto uh, globalizado y también de presiones internas que este tiempo de reorganización estructural y de uh, reorganización también de los vínculos entre los partidos y los electores, y de programatismo que llega, uh, es un tiempo de restricciones políticas y sociales, y de transformación entre una oferta política y una demanda política. Uh, eso, como lo ha mostrado Philip Schmitter, uh, produjo efectos diferenciados según los países, y cada país tiene sus propias características, pero también su propio ritmo uh, de uh, re reorganización estructural. Y estamos saliendo de la tercera parte, y que nos llega al primer mecanismo uh, presentado por Phil Schmitter, de la década de la reintegración, con una combinación del crecimiento económico y una ampliación Uh, de, la de los programas de redistribución. Y creo que uh, esos impactos políticos de la correlación entre los beneficios y los votos, entre uh, lo que ganan uh, los beneficiarios y cómo recompensan los políticos en términos de uh, voto de reconocimiento, uh, podría ser uh, más uh, detallado. Pero Frances lo, lo muestra en términos de uh, ruptura de los vínculos clientelísticos tradicionales, y al final que, uh, lo que dijiste es que no se prueba que habría un uso clientelístico a nivel estatal, a nivel nacional, porque hay como instrumentos que permiten como cortar estos uh, uh, vínculos clientelísticos, como por ejemplo uh, el uso del, uh, de la tarjeta bancaria directamente por las personas y la no mediación por uh, personas políticas. Y con, uh, para terminar, yo quiero como abrir tal vez la discusión con uh, la llegada en esta década de re reintegración, y eso es paradójico, de nuevas frustraciones, que son las frustraciones de las clases medias en algunos países, que están aprovechando también del contexto democrático para salir a las calles y uh, hacer como movimiento social, movimiento de protestación, para pedir un otro uh, equilibrio en las uh, decisiones de uh, distribución. Eso es la curva de Davis sobre uh, la fluctuación relativa y cuando en este contexto de uh, disminución del nivel de crecimiento económico y de uh, mantenimiento de un nivel importante de uh, esperanzas uh, de las poblaciones que han ganado un poco y que quieren más, estamos en ese periodo de posibilidad, explosión de movimientos sociales. Gracias. Yes, thank, merci beaucoup, Frédéric. So, we, we can have uh, our debate. Um, first question. <laughs> 
Thank you. Leonardo? has a different meanings uh, in different uh, uh, contexts. Alternation has a meaning within uh, uh, oligarchic uh, competition, uh, turno, rotativismo, transformismo, are the words that we use for alternation in the 19th century, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Alternation has a, has a different meaning uh, uh, within, uh, say, ideological, uh, with a strong ideological uh, uh, parties. Alternation may uh, have a different meaning uh, today. But my key question is, is this one. Why are you studying alternation? What is your, your key point? Why you think uh, is today a relevant, uh, a relevant question, a, a, a relevant issue? Of course, you can think about alternation in terms of changing people, in terms of changing the, the weight of, of, of the demands, you can think of alternation as the key element for having accountability working, that is a, a sort of within inputs. You can think alternation because when there is alternation, you have a change of policies. But again, if you refer to the evolution, to the different kind. Uh, today, if uh, in Italy, actually in France or in Germany, if uh, the, the left is winning or if uh, the center right is the winning, at the end of the policies uh, are the same. There is uh, just a very narrow range in terms of, of differences. There is a, a, a strong uh, welfare state. The problem in terms of reaction to economic crisis is, is try to, to maintain, to, to save the welfare state. So why you think alternation is important? Uh, third, uh, in the question for, uh, for, for Philippe, yes, you, you are right. In these 10 years, uh, the problem of Latin America, the quality is, is important in terms of uh, decline of uh, inequality. And we see, but a, a, a specific aspect we should reflect on is the fact that when we consider Venezuela, Venezuela is the case where in these ten, last 10 years, uh, we have, uh, in a sense, the, small, uh, the, the highest uh, improvement in terms of equality. But in Venezuela, we are not even, uh, uh, for some years, even someone say today, in a democratic regime. It's uh, what we, we may call a hybrid regime. Uh, so there is a problem, in fact, of corruption. There is a problem of uh, uh, institutional accountability of, uh, or, if you like, horizontal accountability, very, very, very serious. Uh, so the point is that uh, apparently there is a, a trade-off in terms of, uh, of time. That is, uh, when we have uh, countries such as Brazil, such as Chile, such as Argentina, who had a decline of inequality in the last uh, 10 years, but this decline was slower. When we have a, a decline of inequality in, in Venezuela, uh, this decline was paid with higher corruption, which was, was paid with, again, a hybrid regime that is violating some of the key elements, the key aspects of a democracy. So just your, your reaction on this. Thank you. Lawrence. Uh, mine was for Philippe. I thought that it was very interesting to have the reminders of the... Uh, on the one hand, expectations that democracy might improve equality and the puzzling evidence that for a long time, at any rate, it didn't. And you said the two theories 
one of which would point to um, empowering the lower classes and the second would be the median voter, uh, but there wasn't perhaps enough time to say a third, uh, to develop the third hypothesis that uh, the kind of maybe democratization in itself contains, democratization as such may contain a number of uh, provisions that facilitate inequality. For example, if democratization is accompanied by strengthening the rule of law, well, the people who can pay for lawyers are not going to do badly out of a stronger uh, rule of law. If democratization means that uh, political parties are uh, very highly motivated to win the next election for which they need private finance, then private money may be empowered and may, of course, be able to impose uh, conditions uh, associated with the parties that it, and the programs that it finances. If, um, I mean, one can carry on with uh, similar uh, arguments. Uh, for example, democratization has uh, taken place in a context where it has empowered uh, consumers rather than producers, so uh, there, are, there are distributional effects there and so on. Now, the question is, is that inherent to democratization or is that something that was associated with the particular wave of democratizations we had in the 1980s and 1990s, which coincided, as you say, with the other factors, globalization, collapse of communism and so on. Uh, after all, the democratizations that we started with in the 1970s in southern Europe were indeed looked as though they were pro-equalization uh, rather than anti-equalization. The outcome of democracy is it legitimizes the policies that might otherwise be contested. So uh, if the balance of power favors the rich, and then the electoral process uh, shows that uh, the voters are endorsing that, uh, well, then that consolidates the inequality. <laughs> no, I guess there is a lot of hate, but that's all right. <laughs> okay, uh, there, is, there are a lot of questions. Mar Marta? Okay, first I have to apologize because after speaking, I have to leave the airport. But still, I will. Uh, leave leave the, the microphone. Um, my comment, maybe question is uh, to Adam. I think it's uh, beautiful and fascinating to declare the inexistence of Latin America. And we have done so, so many times in, in our reports since 1995. But, you know, there's a persistence of the existence of Latin America that is troublesome. First of all, as I showed yesterday, there is a unity of values they seem to go the same way, which is a very strong argument for the existence of one. Then there is, at the same time, this 18 different cases, which are all exceptional, very difficult to, to make a typology, almost impossible. And then there is this amazing phrase from you saying, you know, you could place Chile in the middle of Europe. Maybe you can place the four squares of Santiago that have 22,000 per capita income in the middle of Europe, but you can certainly not put the 60% of the population that has only 7,000 per capita income, because then you would have a massive migration and there'd be nobody left in the country. So I think you're talking about two Chiles there. So uh, beware of the fact that you know when you talk about Latin America, you're talking about uh, different parts of different parts of societies, uh, and therefore it's it's very tricky to do. Uh, yeah, it, uh, no, no, no. I'm I'm just saying I'm just saying that the the gap is distinctively uh, different than in in Europe. Not that there is no gap in Europe, but the 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 floor in Europe is our ceiling. So you know you have to compare comparisons there. It, it, it's it's highly complicated. So. I would say, uh, you know, I wouldn't place Chile in the middle of Europe. By no means, there would be nobody left there. At least seven million people would emigrate on the day after. And, uh, and, and, then, and then there is Latin America. Um, there is this uh, Latin America in the culture. And so, you know, I think, yes, 
there are many reasons to declare it non-existent, but then on the other side, there's so many reasons to declare it exists. And I think the comparatism, I, maybe it's in one region in the world that has more reasons to exist than Africa or Europe. Diversity in, in Europe is even bigger than, than in Latin America, I would, I would say, or Asia, for that matter. Thank you very much. May, may I? Yes, well, before she leaves. yes, it's two minutes. And Less then. than that. So I have a challenge for you. Replicate your study in my native country and then show the results to people, Latin America and Poland, without attaching labels, and ask them to find the outsider. Poland, yeah. Poland has much more to do with Chile than with Honduras. And Poland has much more, much less to do with Sweden than with Chile. Poland is a Latin American country, I know, because I went from Poland to Chile, and I knew I was culturally at home. <laughs> Catholic, conservatives, unequal, massive unemployment, hundreds of thousands of people migrating from Poland to Ireland and England. Your Chileans, yes, they just come from northeastern Poland. Do it. And who are the Mapuche of Poland? <laughs> the data is there. The data is there. Um, yeah, I've seen the Ingelhardt map. It goes like this Latin America and then a long, 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 long tongue to embrace Poland. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to take stock of this uh, high level panel for. Uh, addressing me too as, uh, as uh, Leonardo, uh, a couple of methodological issues. Uh, I, I share the idea, Marta, uh, oh, you mentioned also this, that uh, is very hard to work on Latin America without uh, a broader comparative dimension, including, for instance, Europe. Uh, that uh, I think is a largely shared uh, methodological approach. I guess the, the transitology uh, helped by that uh, comparison with Southern Europe before, with Eastern Europe, so it was quite helpful in uh, in uh, understanding the Latin America in the last uh, 20 years. So this is the first point. I think uh, we can agree, uh, largely agree. But there is a second point, which is uh, particularly relevant to me, uh, which is the interplay between comparative uh, politics and international relations. Uh, many of you mentioned factors which are uh, inter international factors in, uh, by understanding the democratization. Uh, you mentioned uh, globalization and uh, the end of bipolarity. You mentioned ne neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is an international movement that started in the United States and the UK. So the, this interplay between international factors and domestic factors is also a key element. It looks to me as a, as a main trend and is a largely shared trend. And number three, there is another one. Uh, someone said, uh, you, uh, institutions matter, okay? That is also a shared point of view, but uh, more than that, more than that. Uh, I, I am very interested in the fact that many of you mentioned critical historical junctures. Uh, you mentioned 89-91, for instance, or others mentioned other critical. Of course, there is, there is the national specificity, national diversity. However, some historical critical juncture are relevant, matter for a general process, including the, your historical dimension and uh, in, in approach. So my question to Adam is, to what extent, you mentioned two times the concept of past dependency. How, to, how do you situate in your research, in your comparative research, the past dependency and the critical historical juncture. Because you started by a provocative statement in favor of rational choice institutionalism. But uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, this is, could be problematic and maybe could play in favor of a, of a pluralistic understanding of institutionalism, combining rational choice and historical institutionalism. And the same question can also be addressed to to Philip. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, yes, I have a question for uh, Philippe, and uh, and I would like to build on on what Bert said about uh, uh, other uh, types of inequalities than income uh, inequalities. Uh, I wonder whether you um, you could expand a little bit on that because there is um, an interesting literature on uh, the dif distinction between vertical and uh, horizontal inequalities. So uh, these uh, horizontal inequalities dimension um, seems to be uh, not taken into account uh, in, in your presentation, perhaps uh, because of elements of uh, data reliability or availability. Your reference to the low-income countries under stress, uh, the jargon used by the World Bank, excludes many countries which are characterized, actually, by uh, horizontal inequalities. So I wonder whether you, uh, you would include them uh, had data been uh, more available, and whether you have any plans of, of doing something in that respect. Thank you very much. Manuel tenía una pregunta. ¿Consideráis el fenómeno de la personalización de la política precisamente a partir de los años 2000 eh, que vive América Latina? Y a Adam me gustaría saber si en tu interpretación del del uh, incumbente ¿consideras que hay incumbencia cuando alguien da el relevo a un uh, personaje de su partido o alguien que él uh, tutela? Gracias. Thank you very much. So we have a new round uh, and we begin by Francis. Um, and this is the moment where I'm supposed to say I want to make two points, but I think I have six answers to give. Um, I really would like to ask Philippe about Armenia, but I will just try to refine myself to the... It, it kept coming up in the papers, the most unequal place or the sharpest, but anyway, I'll, I'll try to answer these very good questions, and I thank you all for the chance to clarify a lot of what was not clear in the presentation. I want to begin with Leonardo's question to answer um, what my measures are of programmatic competition and patronage. And it first gives me the opportunity to explain um, a bit of some terms that I jumbled in the presentation. So when I use the term patronage, um, I'm using it both as an umbrella term and as a quite specific term. So quite specifically, patronage refers to the use of state resources for employment. Um, when I speak about the provision of selective benefits at the community level or club goods, I'm speaking about pork. So when we're speaking about infrastructural projects, community development, that would be pork. Clientelism refers to a specific relationship between parties and voters that can be um, an ongoing relationship or it can be a single shot vote buying. So sometimes you hear vote buying, sometimes you hear clientelism, sometimes you hear patronage. They actually refer to different baskets of resources being delivered in particular time frames at particular levels of government using different kinds of resources. Um, and actually, and I'm going to come to the case selection in a moment, but Chile is actually one of the cases in the book. I didn't include it in this paper. And in Chile, we actually see the provision of private resources for clientelism. So th this, is, this actually gets to be a quite complicated story. So my indicators of programmatic competition are few. First of all, I begin with whether or not there's a programmatic divide among politicians and a party. So this begins with surveying of, con of members of Congress along various issue dimensions and then seeing whether or not we have clear and polarized competition of ideas and policy proposals. So when I say clear, I mean that they don't overlap. And when I say polarized, I mean there's some distance between them and that party means something. That's only the first indicator. Um, Actually, and, and this is sort of the same indicator that Kitchelt and his collaborators use when they talk about party system structuration. But I actually think this doesn't mean enough 
if this message is not transmitted to voters. There's a legislative arena and there's the electoral arena. What I, what's in the paper, but I didn't have time to present orally, is that I actually look at campaign messages. And I look at that in two ways. First, I survey my own, the, the people in my own surveys about the messages that they carried forward in electoral campaigns. On what basis did they, um, what promises did they make? I, I, it was very open-ended. You can name your three most important appeals. And I coded those according to whether they were particularistic or whether they were programmatic and what sorts of programmatic issues they were. Um, I also double-checked that against a review of campaigns as reported in newspapers in six-week periods before the elections. And there I look both at presidential campaigns as well as legislative campaigns. And there again, I quote some, so the data are a bit spotty here. Um, in Brazil, for example, I could get regional elections, I could get the, the, the delegation in Rio because global tele, you know, sort of El Mercurio gives every senator's campaign platform but not the deputies. But I took what I could from the four countries and from various election campaign cycles to see the basis of campaign promises as well. And then when I could, I looked at legislative voting behavior as well. So this is a concept that looks at both the, the, the emergence of a, um, of a divide and then carrying those messages forward to the electorate and carrying through on them in a way that voters could identify the differences. Patronage is harder to measure. It is intrinsically hard to measure. So I take two measures, and, and I spend some time discussing this in the book, but, but I take two measures here. One is the opportunity to provide patronage, and the other is to the extent to which we can sort of tap into whether or not politicians actually do that. So the opportunity to do that is I look at the way programs are designed, whether they're designed on a universalistic basis or whether they're designed in a way that allow for the, for, for the uh, provision of pork. So. With, with excuses to the ambassador, we find that infrastructure in Argentina is financed from Menem's list of happiness. Um, and so this is a little bit different from where there are tight budget institutions that don't allow this to happen. So we look first of all at the proportions of the budget that can be closed off to discretionary spending. How much is hardwired and how much is available for discretion? And then I go back to, again, the same campaign um, promises, both in the surveys and in newspaper accounts. And there you could actually see people saying, I, in, in quite ways that you could consider to be a noble form of the representative relationship. I promised that I would do something for the community. I promised that I would work on the transposition do Rio San Francisco. Um, I promised that I would deliver benefits to my community versus those who said, I promised I was going to work on education or I promised I was gonna work on equality. So I looked at that, so that's the way in which I measured programmatic um, competition and patronage. Um, and uh, while I'm on this, I wanna address Manolo's point about whether or not I considered the personalization of politics. So here I presented a dichotomy of programmatic competition or patronage, but we know there's actually other ways in which parties, they can compete on the basis of personalism or very critically, that which I didn't present orally, but some of you may have seen on the diagram with a little bit in red in the bottom where I, you, where I brought up the term valence. At some point, parties also compete on the basis of of being competent in office. So I actually have a, I spend some time working out what I think the relationship is between the provision of public goods. First you need program, and then you need to say that you can deliver them competently. But personalization of politics, I didn't, in the cases I was working with, I, I actually didn't focus on that as a third major alternative, no. Uh, I, I just didn't, but you know, you're right to raise the question to bring it up. Okay, so following now from this definition of patronage and clientelism, I got a couple of questions about, um, one from Bert and one from Mitch, about um, did I consider other forms of patronage? What about the Bani Deesi? What about um, the PT using the state? This is a criticism that we often hear these days, that the PT is re, um, 
we have ISI Mark II. We have the PT using state institutions to pick champions, to reward um, um, big state actors, and isn't this patronage. It is something that you know I don't support, but um, the boundaries of the of the project are really about political representation. So while I concede to you that this could be seen as a form of using state resources to buy favors, it's not really about the political representation that I'm trying to study. But I take it as a very important point, and. Mitch, you raised a similar question, but I, you gave me an opportunity to say something very different. And that is, when you bring up LBJ, I, um, you know, we had the opportunity to see uh, Brian Cranston and, and all the way with LBJ. If it gets to Broadway and any of you have a chance to see it, we, we saw it in Cambridge before it goes to Broadway. So this is a period in American history that, um, if, I, if we, we had the diagram back up about the trade-off between program and patronage, you would say, well, in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s, you could barely tell the difference between political parties. And I would also say that this is a time when, when American politics was largely driven by constituency service and pork. But the thing is, in recent years, as I watch what's happening in American politics. I begin to question everything I believe. I started this project many years ago because some of you know that my first project on Brazil, I became terribly depressed about the power of traditional elites and about the power of clientelism. And I became very interested in what would happen under the conditions of neoliberal reform if the state's scope for economic intervention in the economy were reduced, what would happen to clientelism? This was sort of my original motivation for this project. And I really thought if you could get rid of clientelism, then you could have good politics. Then you could have the provision of public goods. Then you could allow vote, you could empower voters to hold their leaders accountable. Then you could start to see a transformation of politics and the social consequences of politics. And when I think back to this period and I think about how the Civil Rights Act got passed, I think maybe a little bit of pork wasn't such a bad idea. So, um, it, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe we maybe let's not carry uh, this clean politics too far. I, I'm not sure. Um, okay, okay, and then I'll be done. Um, so I had a third point somewhere. I don't well, see it. No. Maybe you can yeah, maybe. Take the, take the okay, okay. So, 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 so I can I can, I can do this now. So <laughs> this is very quickly then to answer Frederick's point. Um, traditional elites, um, what happens when they're defeated? So far, this hasn't been a problem in the Latin American countries that I've studied. So far, people believe that there's still a chance of alternation. They believe they can still come back into office. So I don't think these are yet winner-take-all elections in that way. But I think you're right to raise that question. And then the last point that I um, will make, I will make very one quick, very one very quick comment about the socioeconomic consequences, because this relates back to Leonardo's, in some of the discussions we've been hearing for two days, about um, whether or not we should have a pure political definition of democracy, or whether or not we need to bring in the socioeconomic dimension. And so I guess here what I want to say is that I had this um, debate with Leonardo about 15 years ago, I don't know if he'll remember, when I said, Leonardo, don't you think we need to have a political definition of democracy? He said, I don't see how you can talk, speak about democracy without speaking about the social rights of democracy. I simply don't see it. So I went back and I read Marshall after that. And the way I read Marshall was that there were social rights that enabled people to be citizens. And that is different from from the Gini coefficient. So I think what I want to say here is that the kinds of transformations that I was highlighting in the paper of freeing people to be able to be voters, that is part of a definition of equality of democracy. But the reason that it's important is that the socioeconomic consequences that we can see that Frederick raised, um, we see because this is now possible. 
Because of this, we now see the expansion of health care programs. Because of this, we now see the expansion of other kinds of redistributive policies. So I think that's where we draw that distinction. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, Philip. Okay. Um, I think the, bre the broadest theme that emerged from the comments is this question. I, I like this concept of the interweaving of inequalities. As, and uh, obviously, we concentrated on a single aspect. We wanted, incidentally, to include inequality on a territorial, if you want to call that your horizontal dimension. Uh, we have sporadic information. Unfortunately, most countries do not calculate regional or subnational GNP, and, and, et cetera. You can get it from some countries, but not enough. So, there was simply a, a but the, you're absolutely right. It would be very interesting if we had data on what has happened to center periphery differences as a result of these changes. And we don't have the data. But behind this is a question which I think maybe uh, Fran's paper uh, raises. Uh, I don't know if I agree with the, the way she treated it, but and that is, is it the case? Uh, if we have an interweaving of equalities and inequalities as a result of these changes, specifically, of course, democratization. So we have a package of different things, and she just mentioned that obviously democratization brings with it some, I think, real uh, changes in freedom, sense of having choices, and some probably uh, more dignified treatment in, in general, sort of less sporadic and arbitrary treatment by police, et cetera. Those are real benefits uh, in, in some sense. But the question that I ask, and I, uh, I think uh, Francis has answered it, but I don't agree with her, is whether or not this is some kind of, quote, rational choice. So did democratizers rationally choose to both tolerate and in some cases even increase or encourage greater economic or income inequality in exchange for freedom and uh, more symbolic and other things. Was this a, a, a tactic, a kind of delaying tactic? Did democratizers deliberately, in other words, make this kind of combination? And the kind of soft rational choice that Fran is using suggests that this might have been the case. I don't have any independent evidence of this, I doubt it very much. But still, as I say, it, it's, it's a possibility that there really is a kind of strategy in her sense of the term that followed democratization, precisely because democratization occurred at a particular moment in the kind of historical pattern of development of capitalism as you move, essentially, from industrial to financial capitalism. It's not trade liberalization that's neoliberal. Trade liberalization is an extremely minor part. What really counted was financial uh, liberalization, and that had more, much more of the effects, I think. The question was raised about sustainability. For many of these countries, certainly compared to Western Europe, these are sustainable. These are countries with relatively low tax burdens, lots of potentiality for increasing indirect taxes, not to mention others, lots of, of course, of informal economies that eventually enter into and in